Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and start. We're going to talk about prioritizing your product backlog and the things that we have to do to make sure we have a uh, well-structured product backlog. One of the most important things on a Scrum project, right? It's going to be an agile project in general, making sure we're working in priority order. I want to talk about uh, three techniques. Actually, yeah, three. We're right, going to talk about four techniques, actually. I want to talk about Kano analysis, theme scoring. I think I've got theme screening in here as well. And then another one called relative weighting. Okay, so we're going to talk about three main techniques for doing this. There are others, but these are the three that I want to focus on today. Um, I'm going to use a couple of terms I want to make sure we're familiar with. I'm going to be talking about a product backlog, which is really just a Scrum or Agile Project's prioritized features list, a list of the things that we're going to do. I'm going to be um, talking about the product backlog, and I use the term user story to represent the product backlog items. User story for me is a short, simple statement about what we're trying to do. Um, and we're going to be looking with, working with this thing called a product backlog. I tend to think of it as in the shape of an iceberg. Many of you have heard about this already if you've been with me earlier today. Don't worry, we're only going to spend a minute on this, if that. The idea with the product backlog iceberg for me is that we have small user stories, medium user stories, a little bit farther off on the horizon, and then bigger ones below there. Right? <clears throat> Two terms that I also like to use with stories and backlogs. Epic and theme. And epic is a big one. Right? I think of something like Homer, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, two epic poems, great big poems. Theme. A theme is a rubber band around a group of small user stories. So we've got epics and themes, and then regular old user stories. Here I'm showing the uh, user stories getting broken down and moved to the top. And then here's what I just described with epics and themes. So I want to talk about these. Um, so now the first technique that I want to describe to you that we're going to use for prioritizing is one called Kano analysis. Um, we're going to look at these different techniques today. And Kano analysis is a unique one in that we can use it with both expert opinion or with user interviews. We can go out and we can survey people and do Kano analysis, or we can sit in our office, I'm a smart person, let me figure it out. Right? We can use the other techniques that we're going to talk about today with expert opinion only. We don't really use user interview to figure those out. So let's talk about Kano analysis to get us started. Uh, you know what? Screw that. I don't want to talk about Kano analysis. Um, I want to talk about what's on my mind for a moment. Um, you know, we just finished a session. We had the breaks between the sessions, so I took a, a, a quick look at my email to see if anything was happening in the email world today. And I got an email from my wife, who's back home in Colorado, which is having wonderful weather right now. And her email says, we're water skiing this morning. Ha ha. So she and my daughters have gone out water skiing. Well, I'm here. I love being in Norway, but I'm a little bit jet lagged right now, right? And I'm working all day, and my wife and daughters are water skiing. So I'm pissed, okay? I'm pissed off enough that I want to share, especially because it's being video recorded, a bad story about my wife, okay? So here it is, and bring on the divorce, right? Here it is. We got married a long time ago. We married for almost 21 years. And back in 1993, my wife, whose name is Laura, decided she wanted a new car. It would be the first new car we would buy since having been married. We got married in 88, 93, she wants a new car. So we go around and we look at all the cars remotely in our price range. Because my wife is a certified public accountant, a CPA, and very anal about financial decisions, right? Like, uh, more recently, we had a refrigerator break, and I said, I'll just go to the store and buy one. She goes, uh-uh. How'd I just go to the store? I'd find a salesperson that seems trustworthy. I'd get their advice. I'd find a big fridge. I'd bring it home. My wife has to go on all those uh, consumer reports, websites, and all the ones with the product reviews and all that type of stuff. Has to make sure we're getting the best refrigerator and the best deal. Meanwhile, we go a week without a refrigerator, right? So we're going out to dinner every night, which I think was the real ulterior motive to stalling the refrigerator purchase. So if she was like that with a refrigerator, you can imagine how testing it was of our marriage the first time we have to buy a car together. So we go, we test every car remotely in our price range. It takes us about six weeks. We're going out on Saturdays to test drive the cars. She decides, I want an Acura. And she decides, back in 93, I want an Acura Integra. That's me. But not wanting buyer's remorse, she decides she wants to spend two weeks 
driving home in the afternoon from her job, thinking she's in an Acura and visualizing herself as an Acura dealer. And then she gets out of her car in the garage and looks at it and says, okay, what would an Acura look like there? I want to picture myself as an Acura driver. And so she does this for two weeks. Near the end of the two-week cooling off period, she sees an ad come on the television for Subaru. And it catches her attention, and she says, oh, we didn't drive that car. Why didn't we drive that? And I said, well, the nearest dealer is like two hours away. And we got a problem. We got to drive it two hours. I don't want, I don't want that. She's like, oh, I got to drive that car. The thing that caught her attention, remember this was 1993, the thing that caught her attention was a $2 piece of plastic. Subaru was the first car to have an integrated in-dash cup holder. You push a little button, a little piece of plastic came out. It had three things that looked like they were from a paper clip, and it held a can of soda, right, or a coffee cup or something like that. The other thing to know about my wife, Laura, is she is addicted to Diet Pepsi. She has to have a Diet Pepsi first thing in the morning. Those of you who get up and have to have that first coffee, uh-uh. She has to have a Diet Pepsi when she first gets up. So all she can picture herself now is having a cup holder instead of one of those stupid plastic ones that hook to the door, driving to work. She has a long commute with a Pepsi. So we go drive the car. She hates the car, but she loves the cup holder. So what to do? What to do? Right? And so she is stuck. Do I buy the Acura that I really like that doesn't have the cup holder? Do I buy the Subaru that has the cup holder but didn't fit me very well? I don't like. Well, she hems and haws for four months until Acura comes out with their next model year and has an integrated cup holder, right? So she buys the Acura, life is good, and we go on from there. Okay, that's out of my system, so let's talk about Kano analysis again. I never said there was a point, just, they're water skiing, come on, right? So Kano looked at features and decided there were three types of features on products. The first type of feature that Kano identified is what he referred to as an exciter or delighter. An exciter was a feature that you don't even know you want until you see it. Ah, maybe there was a reason for the Acura Subaru story, right? Laura didn't even know she wanted a cup holder in her car until she saw one. Then it was so important it changed her purchasing decision. So Kano calls these exciters. Second type of feature he identified is what he called mandatory or baseline features. A mandatory feature, if you don't put this in, don't even bother building the product. So let's think about a, a car. Mandatory feature might be a engine, right? Need some sort of engine in there, that's mandatory. Wheels, which are mandatory, right? Third type of feature Kano identified is what he called a linear feature. A linear feature, the more of it, the better. Horsepower in a car, the more of it, the better. Right? So let's see if we can come up with some here. Let's think about a mobile phone for a moment. What's a mandatory feature in a mobile phone? The what? The ability to make calls. What else? Check email. Let's save that one for a second. Batteries. Got to, well, it's got to have some sort of ability to run when it's disconnected, right? Some sort of battery. What about, um, what's a linear feature on a mobile phone? A keyboard? The bigger the better, or perhaps? Battery life is a linear feature. The longer the battery life, right? So remember, linears are the more of it, the better. Maybe it's also the less of it, the better. What's the less of it, the better feature on a mobile phone? The size, right? Within reason, I mean, I don't want one that tiny, perhaps, but within reason, the less of it, the better. Size would be a good one. What's an exciter on a mobile phone? Camera? Is camera still an exciter? It was a while ago. Become linear. Become linear? Is, is camera linear now? Yeah. What's that? Touch screen. Touch screen might be an exciter. All right. Let's go back to the email one. What is what is the ability to get email on a on a phone, do you think? Is it a exciter? Is it mandatory? Linear? Depends who you are. Who you Okay. So different audiences might have different opinions about this, right? My 13-year-old um, my daughter just got her first phone recently. Um, I don't know if her phone gets email. If it does, she certainly hasn't set it up. Um, I'm really bad at the phone. Um, when I, before, before I got an iPhone, I had a, 
some sort of AT&T phone or something, I would never have it with me. It's just like, you know, I just, I hate getting phone calls. I'm always in the middle of something else. I'm normally teaching or something or working with a client. I never answer the phone anyway. I would go weeks without knowing where my phone was. And then when I'd find it again, I'd look at it and go, ooh, I don't want that many phone calls. Um, but now that I have one that gets email, I carry it with me all the time. So for me to be a manager, I would not buy a phone that doesn't have that. But others might have different attitudes towards it. Let's go back to camera for a second. Remember the ads years ago? I don't remember how long ago it was, but it was like seven or eight years ago. And it was just amazing ads. I remember the ones, there was always some father traveling. He'd take a photo and send it home to the kid, right, while he was traveling. Right? And I'm sure it was some horrible resolution photo, but it was on the phone. Right? That was, ama- that was an exciter. Right? I know they went through a period where they were linear, because you'd see the ads, you know, five megapixel phones or whatever it was. Right? Now, I don't know, maybe it's down all the way to mandatory. Phone, the, uh, phone uh, camera in your phone, somewhere between linear and mandatory. Features tend to move down here. Cup holder, where would cup holder on a car be? Exciter, Exciter still? You're excited when you see that? So, <laughs> you haven't looked for a new car in a long time, have you? <laughs> Driving your uh, 55 VW, right? Uh, I would say, I I saw an ad recently, I saw an ad uh, in a magazine, it was a Honda minivan, seven passenger van with nine cup holders, right, for all the two-fisted drinkers, right, so um, I'm going to say cup holders moved all the way down to mandatory by now. So anyway, Kano came up with three different types of features. Now, we can get this by sitting around being smart people in a room, and that works very well. I'm sure that Subaru knew they were onto something when they invented the in-dash cup holder. Right? So being a smart person alone in a room, very valid approach. Alternatively, we can go out and do some surveys. The key when we do a survey is how we construct that survey. We need to ask the question about a feature two ways. We need to ask the functional form and the dysfunctional form, meaning how do you feel if this feature is present and how do you feel if it's not? If we just do the typical product survey, please rate the importance of this feature on a 1 to 10 we don't get back useful results. Think again about my wife. And let's say that Subaru emails, well, 93, they wouldn't have emailed. 93, they mail her something and says, how do you feel about an engine on a one to 10? She would have said 10, I need an engine in my car. And then she would have had the next question, how do you feel about having a cup holder in your car? How important is that? Well, 10. And Subaru would have got feedback back saying that engine and cup holder were equally important, right? Not true, right? But that comes from asking the question the wrong way. What we need to do is ask, how do you feel if it's there? How do you feel if it's absent? So let's look at an example of this. When I travel, I like to go for a run. Normally the first thing I do, I go for a run, kind of shake out some of the jet lag. So I traveled to Boston, which is a long flight from where I live in the US, about a four hour flight. So I land in Boston, Boston's kind of hot and humid. I go for a run. I finish my run, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I come back into the hotel, and there's a bottle of water, not one this nice, it wasn't a Voss, there's a bottle of water sitting on the counter with a little tag on it, and I know what it's going to say, it's going to be provided, by, provided for your enjoyment, you know, $20 or something, you know, some outrageous price on there, I mean, 500 kroner, and um, I, you know, I don't want to spend that, but I walk over and I look at the bottle of water, and it says, free, provided for your enjoyment. I open it up and I chugged it down, right? So let's see what type of feature that was. So let's ask that question in the functional form, if it's present. If your hotel room includes a free bottle of water, how do you feel? Now, Kano gave us five standard responses. I like that. Well, I kind of expect it that way. Eh, I don't care, I'm neutral. Or I can live with that. I can live with a bottle of water in there. I'm allergic to water. I can live with it. I dislike it. I do not want water in my room. I hate that stuff, right? Fish pee in it. Um, old W.C. Fields joke, right? If your hotel room includes a free bottle of water, how do you feel? Well, I like it that way. If your hotel room does not include a free bottle of water, how do you feel? Well, I kind of expect it to be that way. Most hotels I go to, I don't get a free bottle of water. So what type of feature is this? I like it if I get it, but I don't expect it. What do you think that is? It's an exciter, right? That free bottle of water was an exciter. Four years later, I'm still talking about it, right? Kano gave us a grid for comparing answer pairs and coming up with the answer, seeing what a feature was. So we just had, we were looking over here at the functional question. We said we like it. 
the dysfunctional form, I expect it to not be there. When we cross-reference those, we'll see that Kano says that's an exciter, which is what we just said. Now, you'll notice up here we've got a couple of different types. We've got the mandatories, the linears, and the exciters that we just talked about. But we've also got questionable, reverse, and indifferent. Indifferent is the whole middle section. Right? How do you feel if there's a watermelon in your room? Oh, I don't really care. I'm not, it's too big. I'm not going to cut it up anyway. Right? We've got questionable. You'll notice questionable appears at the two corners, two of the corners. Questionable is you, you confused the survey taker. The, the person got confused. How do you feel if there's a bottle of water in your room? Oh, I like that. How do you feel if there's not a bottle of water? Oh, I like that too. Right? Do enough surveys, you'll get some questionable responses. And then reverse, you're about to do something that the user doesn't want. Right? How do you feel if there's a, a gorilla in your room? Uh, hope not, right? Don't need a free gorilla in every room, right? So six different possible responses. The three we're really interested in are those first three, the mandatory, the linears, and the exciters, okay? Now, I want to show you one example of doing this. This was a company, uh, they were in Omaha, Nebraska, and they were rewriting a, um, a reporting engine for their company. And we had a number of these. We had more than three. I've just pulled out three. We asked people about uh, style sheets, formatting themes. And what we got back were those were mandatory. People wanted to make reports look a certain way for their department. We said, what about automating report execution? Schedule a report to run a certain time, send its data out. 22 people gave answer pairs that indicated linear, 20 indicated mandatory. I circled them both. I said, it's kind of a tie. We had earlier, when I was talking about the the phone, an email on the phone, somebody says it depends on the audience. Well, here we're seeing one where the different audiences. One set of users that we were talking to considered that feature mandatory. Another set of users considered that feature to be linear. Turned out here, we should have thought about this. I'm embarrassed that we didn't. But we found out later when we looked at which type of people were answering one way or the other, that departmental administrators felt like this was mandatory. They were running all sorts of reports. They wanted to schedule them. Other people programming the department might run one bug defect report a week or something. If he had to run it manually, didn't really care. So departmental administrators considered scheduling mandatory. Others, yeah, we can live with it. We'd kind of like it, but it's okay. The third one, I remember the day we thought of this third feature. One of the programmers said, what do people do after they run a report? In the current system, what do they do next? And the analyst said, oh, oh I know the answer to that. Every time they run a report, what they do is they go into Excel and type in the data so they can create a pretty graph to put together into a PowerPoint. And the programmer said, well, that's stupid. PowerPoint's an open format. We could export our report right into PowerPoint format if they want. And the analyst went, oh, that's going to be nice. <laughs> we knew right then we were on to something, but we wanted to do the survey to see what we came up with, just for completeness. And you'll see we found out that that was indeed an exciter. Okay. Now, here's how to use Kano analysis when we prioritize, and I'll talk about the next technique. When we do Kano analysis, you want to include all of the mandatory or baseline features, right? by definition. Right? If you're not going to put this in, don't build it. Right? Don't build a car without the wheels. Don't build a phone without the ability to make calls. Right? Put in some amount of linear features, as many as you can, while still leaving room for exciters. Our exciters are features that will build up a lot of interest, they'll build up goodwill for the product. Now you may think I'm talking just about commercial products. I'm not. Let's say you're building something for your own internal users. Still toss in a couple of exciters. These will get your internal users engaged in the process. They'll be excited about the features that you're giving them. They'll be happier with the software. Right, so even on internal stuff, the type of software, I've been in these type of situations, where you could walk down the hallway and say, here, it's a piece of crap, but you have to use it. Right? Even in those type of situations, try to not build a piece of crap, but add exciters. Right? Get those people engaged in the process. And the best way to do that is to put some exciters in there. So all the mandatory, some linears, while still leaving room for exciters. Right. Let me pause there in case there's a question or two on Kano analysis before we go on to theme screening. Yeah. Well, if it's mandatory, I don't have any choice. 
If it's truly mandatory, I have to put those in there. But I might do a feature that, I might do a product that was, let's well, say, 80 mandatories, two linears, and two exciters, right? A little bit of an exciter goes a long way. I don't know how many people remember or ever saw one of those 93 Subarus, but I'm, I'm totally serious. It could not have been more than $2 worth of parts, right? I mean, it was the cheapest little thing. I mean, if they ever tried to market that now, people would think they were crazy, right? I mean, the, the quality of that little cup holder that came out was, was crap, right? But it was amazing at the time, right? So, a so the point with an exciter is you don't have to do much of it. A little bit of it goes a long way. So if I only have room, and I, it's silly to talk about all features being the same size, but if I only have room for four more features, two linears, two exciters, that might be where I'd go, right? You get a lot of bang for a little bit of investment in the exciters. Let's talk about theme screening, then we're going to practice this technique. Um, theme screening is, um, to do theme screening, what we do is we select some criteria. What are the most important things to us in deciding what should be in the next release? And we think about the features that we'd like to build, and we think about what's going to help us make that decision. I always use my wife again as an example. So Laura's looking to buy a new car. What were the criteria that were important to her in making the decision? Well, it had to be four doors, had to be in our price range. She wanted it to be reasonably stylish. She's not really big into horsepower and performance or anything like that, so that may not have been on her list. Right? needed to be reasonably safe. We were planning to have a, a kid within the next few years. So she would look at those type of things. Those would be her selection criteria. What we do then is we select a baseline theme. Remember that a theme is a um, collection of user stories. And we're going to prioritize more at the theme or epic level than the individual story level. So we're going to look at the themes, and we're going to pick a baseline theme, one that's likely to be in the release. Not guaranteed to be in the release, but likely to be in the next release. Pick that as our baseline theme. Now, the reason I want to pick one that's likely but not guaranteed is this. If you pick the most important theme, say I said pick the most important theme, and then you compared every other theme to the most important theme, they'd all come up worse, right? So if I pick one that's kind of barely in, and I compare all others to it, some will definitely be in and some will definitely be out. So pick one that you think will be in but is not guaranteed to be in, and then we're going to compare every other theme to that. Let me show you an example. Everything's easy with an example. We've got lots of examples here. So here's one. We've got seven themes we're considering. Normally I would have the text of them, but it wouldn't show up, so I don't have it. So we've got seven themes, seven things that we want to add to our product. I've got some selection criteria, the things that are important to us. You know, we've got to add some features for existing customers. New customers love us, but we need to get some uh, existing customer features in there. Keep those guys happy. We've been shortchanging them. A new competitor entered our space, and we don't compare well with them. We better get out some features that help us compare to that, that company well. Remember that acquisition we did last year? We promised people we would integrate our product with theirs. Eh, it's been a year. We probably should start doing that, right? And the last, these are all real ones. They're not all from the same company. This, this example is made up. I'll show you. The next example, I think, is a real one. This one is made up. Um, we've got a great fourth quarter coming, but we've got a horrible second quarter. right? We don't need more products in the October through December time frame, but we need some great stuff to come out next second quarter. We need something to come out in April or May that can at least make us some money because we're putting a big investment in the fourth quarter product. We're confident in that, but we need something in Q2. So that was one we had at one company as a selection criteria. So now what we do is we look at our, we pick a baseline theme, something likely to be in, and we give it zeros down the column. It's zero down the board. Then we look at each other theme and we compare it criteria by criteria to the baseline. So I look at theme A and I say theme A is a little bit better than the baseline at helping our existing customers. It's also better at helping us compete with ABC and at integrating product lines. It's looking pretty good so far. I said, okay, Q2 revenue, well, it'll make about the same amount of money in the second quarter as the baseline. So I'm going to give that a zero. Now what we do, all we're going to do is we're going to net out the pluses and minuses. In this case, we have no minuses. We've got three pluses, so we give this a net score of three. Everybody with me on that? It's all real simple if I go slow enough, but when I plop up the whole screen full of numbers, it gets confusing looking. So all we're doing is netting out the pluses and minuses. Theme B, we do the same thing. How is theme B compared to the baseline? for existing customers. Well, it's better too. But you know what? It's not as good at helping us compete with ABC, so we're going to put a negative there, right? This is a simple 
kind of, is it better or worse decision? Not how much worse or a lot worse, just is it better or not? That one's the same and that one's the same. So this one's going to net out to a zero. One plus one minus, it's net to zero. Okay. Let me just fill the others in here a little bit more quickly. So we're just going to fill these in. Now what we do is I'm just going to rank these. I'm going to say, which one got the best score? And I'm going to call that number one. All right, so theme A got our highest score. It's number one. The last one up there is the second best, and then uh, theme E, then it looks like we've got a tie for fourth place, and some sort of last place one there. All right. So all I'm doing is ranking these. Now the way I like to prioritize is I like to have a formal method, like we're describing here, that helps me compare the big things against one another, the themes and the epics. I like to have an approach that lets me do that formally. Once I've done this, then I like to kind of think of myself as opening each theme up. Remember, a theme is a collection of stories, and epic is a big one. I think of myself as opening each theme up and looking inside and saying, okay, this theme's important, but I don't have to do all of it. What are the most important parts of this theme? And then I bring back my good judgment, my intuition, my wisdom. So I like to have a formal method to get the themes compared against one another. Then I start opening each theme up, and I mix and match things based more on good personal judgment. Right, experience in the industry, all sorts of things like that. I'm less reliant on a formal method when I'm going user story against user story. Because normally there, it's more about the sequencing of the work with the team than about which is the highest priority. So I use this final row here, continue. Is this one worth opening up? Right? Does this one go into the expert opinion process? And I'm going to say those four scored high enough that I want to put them into the expert opinion. Right? I don't want to just say, oh, let's do all of A, and then all of uh, G, and then if we have time, we'll do all of the baseline. I don't want to do it as simple as that. I want to see if what's the right mix. Half of this theme and 10% of that theme and 80% of this theme might be the right mix. Okay. And then these are no's. Okay. So that's theme screening. Let me show you one other technique, then we'll practice. You'll practice whichever one of these you like better. So let me show you relative weighting. This, um, again, that one, the, the selection criteria were all real, but it was a made-up set of numbers. This one's all real. Relative weighting, a lot of text on this slide. Don't worry. It's so that you can use this process later. Um, here's the general idea. What we're going to do is we're going to look at each theme, and we're going to assess it two ways. We're going to say, how beneficial is it to get this theme? And we're going to rate that on a 1 to 9. And we're going to say, how much does it hurt if we don't get this feature? And we're going to assess that on a 1 to 9. This is kind of like when we were playing planning poker. Those of you who were here earlier today when we did estimating before lunch. So we're putting some relative measures on here. How beneficial if I get it? How much does it hurt if I don't? 1 to 9. Then what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the, the relative, the percentage amount of each item to the total. We're going to bring cost into the equation. And then we're going to prioritize. Again, a lot of text. This will make sense later. Example shows what you need to see. So let me show you the example. This text will be useful later when you download the presentation. So here's the example. This one's actually e far easier than it looks. This company is called ePlan Services. They sell retirement plans over the internet to US companies, um, plans that are called 401k plans. They're basically let employees save money for retirement. They were looking at a number of features. I've just listed three of them up here. One of the features was to offer people more investment choices. Right now, when a small company signed up with one of their plans, this is a few years ago we did this, a company could choose 10 mutual funds to invest in. They wanted to expand that to 100. They wanted to say, we we're going to offer people 100 funds. So more investment choices was one theme. A second theme was portfolio rebalancing. Portfolio rebalancing is the idea that I should invest, let's say, 40% of my money in big companies, 40% of my portfolio in small companies, and 20% in bonds. And I go through and I set all that up, and then the stock market crashes, and I don't, I'm not balanced anymore, right? So the idea here was once a quarter to buy and sell things automatically to bring everything back into whatever percentages you set up. And then the third one, yeah, new tax law. U.S. government had passed a new tax law. Um, if you didn't comply with the tax law, pay a fine type of thing like that. So uh, another feature. We looked at these. We had others, but these are the three I wanted to focus on because I can't put all 17 on one slide. We looked at these, and we said, what's the benefit of more investment choices on a 1 to 9? And we decided, yeah, that's pretty good. That's a, that's a big benefit. We'll call that an 8. 
We said, well, how bad is it if we don't get that? We said, you know what? People are leaving. We are having some current customers, current clients leave because we don't do that. We said, it's pretty bad. Let's call that a six. And so in total, we had a 14. Okay? These are just relative numbers on a one to nine scale. Then we looked at portfolio rebalancing. And we said, well, how beneficial is portfolio rebalancing? We said, yeah, that's, that's even better than more investment choices because we could do a press release over this one. Right? People would like this. This would be newsworthy. Let's call that a nine. And so we talked to the main sales guy, and we said, well, how much do we lose if we don't have this? He goes, well, this one's not as bad. We're not losing any sales, no angry customers. This is a nice to have. We're going to need it in there someday. But we're not losing anything by not having it right now. And we said two. So we add those up, and we get a total of 11. Everybody with me on the math so far? Hate doing math in the afternoon, right? It's all simple, though. It's going to look ugly, but it's all going to be simple stuff. The third one, comply with a new tax law. What's the benefit of complying with a new tax law? Who would you put up there? Two? Not, somebody yelled 10, right? Not a lot of benefits, just, just the tax law, right? No benefit from it. So we said one, especially the product owner said one because she wasn't going to be the one to pay the fine, right? What's the penalty? Pretty high, right? I'm hearing 10. I don't know if somebody's joking because I've said we're on a 1 to 9 scale, right? And we're saying we're off the charts, like turn it to 11. Uh, so we stuck with the rules. We put the highest number up there. We said the penalty of not doing this is 9. This gave us a total of 10, right? Now, I'm going to add up the total value column and come up with a 35. 14 plus 11 plus 10, 35. Now, this is the cool part, right? You're not going to be able to follow this unless you pay attention. But this is the cool part, one of the cool parts here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what percentage of the total value each of those items is. That first one is 14 35ths of the total value, right? So I divide 14 by 35 and I get that it's 40%. It's 40% of the total value, right? We don't know what those numbers mean. They're just relative numbers. But this first one's 40% of all the good stuff we're talking about. This one represents 40% of it. The second one represents 11 35ths. So it's 31% and 10 35ths, 29%. Any questions on that? Let me make sure we follow that. That's as tricky as it's going to get, but we're going to do that one more time. I can add that up. It obviously should be 100%. Meanwhile, we get some estimates. We have the programmers play planning poker, my favorite way to estimate. And the programmers come up with some estimates for how long these features will take. This could be in story points, ideal days, thousands of kroner, whatever it is. They come up with some sort of estimate. I can add those total estimates up and say, hey, it's going to cost us 146,000 kroner, 146 story points, whatever it is. Now I'm going to do the same thing in the cost percent column that I did earlier in the value percent column. Right? The first one up there is 64 over 146. It's 64, 146 of the cost. With me on that? I'm just figuring out what, what cost percentage it is. That first one is 44% of the cost. The next one is 41 46 of the cost. And the third one is 42 1 46 of the cost. These obviously add up to 100. Okay? A little bit subtle. You've got to see what's going on there. Here's the part that's cool. Here's the part I like. That first item represents 40% of the value, yet 44% of the cost. 40% of the value, but 44% of the cost. What do you think of a feature with those traits? Is that a good deal, bad deal, horrible deal? Its, it's cost is a higher percentage than its benefit. It's a slightly bad deal. I'm paying 44% of the cost for only 40% of the benefit. Something down this list should be a good deal. right? If I got one that's a slightly bad, I better have at least one that's a slightly good deal. Right, we can quantify this by taking the ratio. I can take 40 over 44 and come up with 91. You might want to call this kind of like a payback percentage. This one has a 91% payback percentage. I get 40% of the value for 44% of the cost. It's a 91. Look at the next one. It's 31 and 27. Right. Turns out to be 115. It's got 115% payback. It's a slightly good deal, right? And then the third one actually turns out to be 100. So which one of these would you do if this were you? Which one of those looks most appealing? I think the priority is the second. 
Okay, the second one, based on the priorities here, looks most intriguing. But what? Why not? What do you mean? Well, because it's, it's the one that is not wet. Okay. The third one is a mandatory thing. So, so you're worried about the law? Well, the point is very small. Okay. Um, Okay, so the first, the first, there are not a lot of clients, but people are occasionally quitting, right? People are complaining about the first one. The second one, um, we get a press release out of, um, no, no salvage of, of the few clients that are leaving. Um, but the third one, I liked your use of the term there, mandatory, right? You said the third one's mandatory. Um, this was, this is, again, real situation. The fine was something like $100,000, which was not very much on the first offense. And we're looking at features that could bring in $5 million. So we're looking at features that are going to bring in $5 million, or should we spend our money avoiding a $100,000 fine? And we said, screw it, we'll pay the fine, right? If this was the type of tax law where your, your company president is hauled away on chains in, on the news, right, we would have done that first, right? So your use of the word there, mandatory, brings us back to Kano analysis, right? I like to do Kano analysis first. Why do all this funky math on mandatories? Right? Let's do some quick Kano analysis, even if it's just us alone in a room, pull out the mandatories. Look, I need this one. I'm not going to bother dividing it and multiplying it and taking the sum. It's mandatory. Right? It's, off, it's off the list. Only pull into either theme screening, which we did earlier, or relative weighting, the ones that you have to make some sort of decision on. Mandatories get pulled out. Okay? I want to practice this. So here's what I want you guys to do. We have about 15 minutes to practice this, and we'll talk about it for a few minutes. Let's suppose we're working on our new social networking website. Our new social networking website is called mycookspace.com. We've got a basic site up and running. We've got 4,000 cooks who've registered with us, but we're trying to really quickly expand that to 400,000 cooks. So there I've given you one of your kind of selection criteria or important features, right? Rapid growth. What I'd like you to do is identify two or three themes two or three things that will get us more people on our site. And then as a group, just practice this in a group, um, complete either a theme screening or relative weighting worksheet. Do one or the other. Um, if you're going to do relative weighting, you're going to have to make up your own estimates, right? Just pick some numbers out of your hat for what the programmer said the estimates were. It doesn't matter for this exercise. My hint would be pick numbers that are easy to add up and divide by. Um, and you'll need to do some additional selection criteria if you're going to do theme screening. So um, either one of these, don't do both, do one of them. Just do it for about 15 minutes, just enough to get a bit, of feel, a bit of a feel for it. We'll debrief and talk about pros and cons and which ones you like, and I'll tell you which one I like best. So in groups, practice that for a few minutes. You should have that on your worksheets.
think about it over the next three or four months.
two more minutes. So just go a little bit farther. Uh huh. Okay. Um, you can know there's anything top, down there. Top, top of the roof. Yeah. Hmm. Uh huh. Mm. I'll look for that. So. Yeah, because I get, uh, I'd stay uh, downtown. I end up going to the same places all the time. So. Oh, it's beautiful here this time of year. Oh. Yeah. I, I love coming here this time of year. It's great. So. <laughs> just made that one up. It, just for us. Just for us. I don't know. Somebody might have a website like this, though. Okay, let's come back together for just a couple minutes, get you guys out of here by, uh, by five. I can't talk about time boxing all day and then keep you here late, can I, right? So, uh, you know, a big part of Agile is working inside of time boxes, so I want to make sure I get you done, done on time. Um, hopefully I gave you enough time on uh, relative weighting or theme screening there. If not, you probably got to the point where I was just doing the math anyway rather than the, uh, the thinking. And hopefully you got enough chance to do the math that we see how it works. I do find that... Uh, uh, me talking about it is one thing, giving you at least a few minutes to uh, cement the, uh, the math in your head is uh, much more beneficial, though. So, um, How many people prefer theme screening to relative weighting? How many liked theme screening better? A couple. How many liked relative weighting better? More, but still not on everybody. Um, I use both of these techniques. The thing I like about relative weighting is it brings cost into the equation. Right, if you think back to what we did with theme screening, cost was not a consideration. Right? Theme screening, um, and there's another technique similar to it called theme scoring, are both techniques uh, for what I call prioritizing desirability. How badly do I want this feature? And that's different than the equation will be when we bring cost into it. And one of the things I like about relative weighting is it brings cost into the consideration. It's right there as part of the decision. Theme screening, we don't have cost in the consideration, so we end up having to open up those themes, and we may prioritize our themes and find out that uh, the top one theme takes more than we have available in the next three or four months. And so all that mattered was finding that one most important theme. Um, I do want to mention that these are not techniques I want you to do every single sprint. My recommendation is to do this at the start of a release cycle. A release cycle might be a three or four month period. Right, at the start of a three or four month period, figure out what's important to you. Do one of these techniques to prioritize, open the, back, open the themes up, pick the individual stories, and that becomes the priorities for the next three or four months. They'll shift and adjust as you go through those three or four months, and then at the end of the three or four month cycle, do it again. I recommend doing this on a three or four month cycle, even if you put your software out every sprint. Some software companies, especially websites, will put out new software every two weeks. I still think it's beneficial to have kind of a macro release cycle on top of that where, where we get together every three months and figure out, okay, the software is going out on the website every two weeks, but what are we going to get done in the next three months? What's our target? And try to put some sort of stake in the ground saying, here's where we want to be in three or four months. Gives more, uh, more, more uh, vision to what we're trying to achieve with the product over time. Um, we do have time for a question or two if we have one. Any questions you guys have about prioritizing backlogs? Okay, thank you guys very much, especially for hanging out to the very last one. Here's my contact information. Uh, no, there's not. Those are classes I'm teaching here um, next week. Plus, I'm back in October and earlier. 
Um, here's my contact information. Please feel free to stay in touch with me, or I've got business cards up here. Um, email me. I'm good about getting back to people with questions um, on this or anything else related to Agile. Other than that, thank you very much. I appreciate you guys being here for, uh, through the end of the last session. Thanks.